welcome to South Fair Craftsmanship McHenry County. Uh, this month we have short talks, uh, but a few announcements first. Uh, first of all, thanks to Follett for sponsoring food and the, the building. Um, and also thanks to the LaSalle Network for sponsoring our meetup.com dues. And um, just to give a preview of next month, we will announce this on the meetup site, but right now it looks like we're gonna have a social outing to celebrate the end of the year. Uh, so it will be the similar sort of Tuesday, probably like around 8 p.m. though. Um, so we'll send out details. Uh, and uh, if anyone has restaurant suggestions, let us know. Um, we do have openings for January. And uh, so yeah, we have free talks. We're gonna have, Ralph's gonna talk about raspberry pie. We're gonna talk about um, some mutable and callable Ruby objects, and then Rand is last, and what's your topic, Rand? G-Streamer. G-Streamer, yes. okay. All right, let's hand it over to Ralph. Well, great, well, thank you. So, it's good to be here. It's, um, I've given um, variations on this talk a couple of times, and every time I've done it, is it, is it catching if I stand up? Good. Um, there's always been some technical problem, but but through all these times, I've actually been able to learn from that, and uh, and now I think we're down to uh, maybe I may not eliminate them all, but I hopefully will have a, uh, a resolution. To it. Anyhow, it's not too long before Thanksgiving, and uh, if you're watching the TV shows, you got the you know turkey and and, uh, and all the fixings for for that. And I saw a program the other day where it was uh, sort of non-traditional. Thanksgiving things to kind of make it into that. And that's, that's something, you know, maybe I could do something about, not necessarily not traditional, but maybe some raspberry Pi um, applications that might um, not be as commonly known and used um, that we're sharing with you tonight. Oh, wait. It's a strawberry pie. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so um, what we're going to do is we're not going to talk about that, but we are going to talk about that. Um, and I have uh, a number of demos here. This is part of a, a larger talk that I've given, this, sort of an introduction to the Pi for other people. We're not gonna get into that because uh, all of you know all about the technical stuff. And, uh, and if you um, are interested in it, at the end of the slide deck, my contact information is there to the website. And uh, that will have the complete, not this deck, but the complete slide deck, including all of the interesting um, other stuff that we're not gonna cover today because this is a short talk. But in particular, uh, we were looking at comparing my very first computer to modern computers, you know, with the stuff, so it's kind of an interesting thing. So, um, again, uh, we've all heard of the Pi. We probably have Pies, many of us do. Uh, some of you probably actually are using them for something. Um, you know, home automation or weather, those are real common applications. Uh, or they're just gathering this. So hopefully, I will show you a few of the things that I've used it for. Uh, and uh, you know maybe give you some ideas. So first up, we're talking about the Google Voice Kit. Now, <clears throat> this isn't exactly an innovative or an unusual project, but I don't know if you've heard of this or not. But uh, Google developed uh, two kits. One was the Google Voice Kit, and one was the Google Video Kit. And the idea was is to get someone started really quickly in um, using, um, you know, with the, with the Pi, something useful to do. Uh, it comes with a really nice manual, uh, Magpie, the, uh, the Raspberry Pi magazine, put this out, very colorful. It's great, you know, working through things with your children or yourself. The thing I like about it is you get a lot of bang for the buck, and I'm going to show you what I could do, but they have a version two of this out, and the version two essentially is one that, that ships with a Raspberry Pi Zero. Um, this one, you have to bring your own pie to it. But the interesting thing is that the other one retails for, for, retails for $49.95, but you can get these for 10 bucks. And um, <clears throat> it's a good deal. And that, that link was good, at least it has a little week ago. But it's a nice hat. It's, a, it's an interface card that comes over, uh, plops on top of your pie, and it should work with the zero as well, because it has the same, the same I.O. interface. But uh, it has... Um, an audio amplifier comes with two microphones. Also comes with uh, motor drivers and uh, servo inputs. 
So it basically has done a lot of the buffering. So if you want to, yeah, if you want to kind of experiment with with doing things with this, especially you know knocking out some quick projects with a, without uh, having to go and buy a bunch of resistors and jumpers and things like this, it's not a bad value for ten bucks. Um, the um, application here's the first opportunity for something to go wrong, and it didn't. No, oh, it didn't. It's not getting cocky. Um, this is uh, a Raspberry Pi. Well, by the way, you probably know this, but you can do a remote desktop into your Raspberry Pis. So I have all these things running here. I can just switch between one to the other, you know, through VNC. And that gets shipped with the, uh, you know, that comes standard on the Pi distribution. Really cool. So this is the uh, desktop for this uh, particular box over here in the cardboard box, so you know it's from Google, uh, kind of made famous by their uh, 3D uh, app. And <clears throat> it, had, it comes shipped with uh, the Google Voice interface, so now this thing could become a, a Google Home um, terminal, as well as some other things. Now, right, I can go and buy a Google Home you know, at Best Buy for you know, practically nothing, why do I want to do this? The interesting thing about this is because you're programming this you have access to all of the decoded voice. You don't have to do a lot of um, work to get to that. So if you wanted to have some custom things to do, uh, create your own home automation, do controlling anything, this is the way to do it. Um, it runs under Python, although obviously it has one with some other things here. And the one that I have here now is running over there. We say, hey Google, what time is it? Sorry, I don't understand. Yeah, uh, that's see, hi there. <laughs> just, just like <laughs> but as you can see well. here, it actually decoded that. So this gives you the, the ability to actually go ahead and extend this and to do some really neat things. You can do this with Alexa, but it's a bit of a pain in the neck because you have to put up functions on their server. Um, this one works right out of the box. Uh, okay, Google, what time is it? Sorry, I don't understand. I see. Well, there we go. <laughs> but as you see, it is decoding, and it is, it is actually connected to the internet, obviously, because it's coming up. All right. OK, go, uh, hey, Google, what's the temperature? According to Wikipedia, weather is the state of the atmosphere. Describe, for example, the degree to which it is hot or cold, wet or dry, calm or stormy, clear or cloudy. It works just like that. <laughs> but anyway, that's pretty cool. And if you have a pie around, go on to Amazon, order it for ten bucks. You know the, the hat that goes on it. You get yourself an amplifier, uh, a couple of mics, uh, and all the interfacing to to have a lot of fun. With. You, you said that the hat has a motor control. Yeah, it has, it has motor driver controllers on there. Yeah, it's designed. It, it's not going to run a. Uh, do, they, do they advertise that, or do they, they just sort of? Uh, they, found, know, I don't, they I, found a board that'll drive the mics and the speakers, and that just happened to have that on there. Well, no, no, no. It's not didn't happen to have on. This was designed to oh, do well, that. Okay. Uh, I'll leave this book uh, open um, for after the presentation. After everything's over, you can kind of look through that. It's basically kind of like a project uh, project kit for, for people to play around with. And uh, one of the things is you know controlling controlling motors uh, with your voice, and things like that. So, like I say, it's a lot of bang for the buck. Okay. Oops. Let's see. Let's switch back to here and go back to here. Okay. Hey, Ralph, is there anything else with. I don't have a pie and another board, but is there anything else that comes with the, the plus kit versus the old kit that would make it work? If you didn't have a. If you didn't have a pie that works, is it better to just buy the kit all in one, or is it better to buy a pie separately and get the ten dollars? Oh, well, of course, this is ten dollars, yeah. uh, so you add your own pie to that. Uh, the the new model, the version two, comes with a pie, but it's back to the retail forty nine ninety five. Yeah. So they're 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 just clearing these out. So what does a pie cost? What does a pie zero cost? Like pie zero pie is uh, five bucks, or um, maybe ten if we go with no, the Wi-Fi. Um, if you're willing to drive down to Micro Center when they have them on sale, yeah. <laughs> you can get a, a, I, I've gotten two B3 pluses 
for twenty nine ninety five yeah. each. But you're only you you can only buy one. So if you want more than one, bring a bring a friend, a friend and friend borrow their credit card. Yeah. Um, I've also gotten two Pi Zero Ws. Um, back in March, when they were on sale for three dollars and fourteen cents. Wow. And now that's the W, and, and that's the wireless one. That's what normally they sell for ten dollars. Yeah. yeah. Well, even if even it wasn't, it was a special because of Pi Day. You know, three yeah, years got one more. Up. But if, even if they did, even a lot of times it's on sale for five dollars. The the W, the one that's more expensive is the one that's got the header soldered on. Yeah. So, but on Pi Day, I got a Pi Zero W for three dollars and fourteen cents, and I also was able to buy the case, the official case for three dollars fourteen cents. Yeah. Like, this is just not right. <laughs> <laughs> The, yeah. the chunk of plastic is the same price as the whole computer. Yeah. <laughs> but that's sometimes how that is. Well, thank you for sharing that. You're right. The Micro Center is actually a good place. I scored a couple of my three B, uh, my three plus Bs there to make me three B pluses there as well. Okay. That's what I did in Pi Day. Baker Square. <laughs> I know. The first time I did this talk, somebody brought in a Raspberry Pi. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> because it was that fresh Raspberry Pi type of thing. I got, I got raspberry pies in the freezer and we grow our own, so. Oh, uh, probably didn't bring one. I didn't bring one. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. One thinking. No, that's okay. I wasn't thinking that. about that until just a couple of minutes ago myself. Um, so let's, let's, let's do something that probably is a little bit unusual. Um, a uh, raspberry pie as a radio transmitter. Um, it's interesting that the pie has um, general purpose input output pins. So the thing's a three volt line, but it does generate that. It also has a frequency generator in it. Um, so it is possible actually to go ahead and use this as a um, low power transmitter. Couple caveats here. One is if you're going to do this, be sure that you're operating on frequencies that allow low power non interference uh, and or being an amateur radio operator. Even then you have to actually do that. Um, there's something on YouTube, I think there was a pirate radio th uh, station video I saw in there, and uh, the second key of this is you, you'd never stick the wire directly on the pin. They had this this uh, video in here, so oh, okay, I just put this wire on it, and now we're actually able to transmit. The thing is, is that because this is a square wave, the output is not pure. It's a, it's a clean output, but because it's a square wave, uh, it has to uh, be filtered. Otherwise, you're going to be putting out signals on, on uh, more than a frequency. Multiple harmonics. Definitely. A square wave is the yeah. thing. Um, but if you come in here, I actually have a board. Uh, you can actually make your own filter for this, but I, I actually ended up having one uh, that I, could, I ordered on the internet because it was nicely surface mounted here. Um, so that raises the question uh, just how far can you go? <clears throat> Um, quick propagation, just a minute here. Um, how far a radio signal travels is, is dependent upon a lot of factors, but one of them is the frequency uh, that, that the transmitter is operating on. So higher frequencies like cell phone, TV uh, stations, FM radio stations, um, operate uh, what they call line of sight because they, 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 they can't really get past the curvature of the earth under most circumstances. But things get interesting as you lower the frequency. This is why what will happen here is, is when the, the radio station transmits, it will actually go up into the ionosphere, way up in the atmosphere, and start bouncing up and down. So I thought, well, that's an interesting concept. This is why uh, at night on AM broadcast, sometimes you can hear stations hundreds of miles away or short wave stations. It's the same principle. So the question is, how far can I get out with this Raspberry Pi. Uh, so what I did, uh, I was running, I was testing two types of antenna. One was a three uh, foot uh, diameter loop. It was just a, a loop of wire and an interface. And the other one was essentially that loop, but extended out, you know, just basically straightened it out. And I then took turns, connected it up to here, and then I transmitted. And there's something called whisper. Uh, that's weak signal propagation for pointing. And that's basically, I can transmit here, and stations that are located, you know, around can pick, can pick me up. And if they do pick me up, they're able to report that back on the internet. So back in March, when I hooked this up, I go, yeah, I wonder how far this will go. And it turns out, not too bad. 
Wow. Uh, almost 1,700 miles from the Raspberry Pi, running anywhere between a hundredth of, uh, basically I calculated, it was either like a hundredth of a watt up to a tenth of a watt. Pin connected right there. Uh, so when you know it's you, ah, that's my call sign. And this is the information that I transmit. So it isn't, it isn't so much like, can you hear me? This is a, these are digitally encoded <coughs> signals in there. So they know that this is who I am. This is the frequency I was transmitting on. This is my uh, signal strength over at that location. And this is what they call a grid square. So that's how I know. Is that and 20 meters, that 14 megahertz? Is that a, is that a uh, HF uh, band? Yes, that is an amateur radio <laughs> 20 no. meter band. That's 20, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. 20 meters. So the next time you wonder about like how far can these LED lights cause havoc to your radio? When was uh, what time of day was? Cause that's this was during the day. Yeah. Uh, let's see when was it? Uh, um, two a.m. Uh, two a.m. So that's uh, six by nine. Nine, okay. nine, nine a.m. Yeah. And, and again, this wasn't you know this is not the tele. This is not my best. I just that was just happened to be a day I picked up. We're at uh, what we call the lull of the sunspot cycle, which means there's less uh, ability for the ionosphere to reflect things down. So, come about five or six years, you know, we could easily talk to your or you know be able to communicate. Pretty cool though. When you put antennas on there, do you have to worry about? Uh, well, obviously, you don't want lightning hitting it, but any kind of static buildup and damaging, you put like some kind of diode oh, protection. Oh, um, that, that's a good point. Yes, it does have a protection. That was one of the things with this board that I got. Okay. Because so I needed the filter. As I told you, you don't connect the wire to that because that's bad news. You're going to be you stand. You may be interfering with other people, sure. and they will come down on you really bad on that, especially if it's a, the same military or your government. But it also has a little bit of a buffer, so that yeah. protects it for that. All right, so on a related note here with radios, and this one you may have heard of too, there's a service called the, uh, the Automated Dependent Surveillance Broadcast, ADSB, ADBP. Uh, and that is a system that is in airplanes that uh, basically is their beaconing, uh, where they, uh, this, is, this is not the scale, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, what they have is the, the airplanes will go in and, and get a GPS fix so they know where they're at and what time of the day it is, and then it will come down to a ground station, and then uh, those that type of information will be able to be printed. Uh, you've got the flight aware that, uh, or that, that yeah, actually exists. Yeah. This is a home, not a homemade one, but this is one that I, I built. Yeah, it's like around 1 gigahertz. Yep, it's 1.090 gigahertz. Okay. So, so what I have here, so I have a little receiver there. What exactly is 1.090? Uh, it's 1.090 gigahertz. That's the frequency that the aircraft are okay. transmitting on. And they will squawk out their position, their altitude, and their direction every few seconds. And um, so we're going to try that. Again, this is just a receiver. You can also get one of the little dongles uh, for a few bucks that does the same thing. And this is another Raspberry Pi that has this really neat case. It's got a, uh, a heat sink on it. It doesn't need a heat sink for that, but it's there. That and dongle for the software radio gets pretty, it gets warm. Yes. I'm surprised how warm it gets. <coughs> well, it's doing a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's doing a lot of processing here. It's glad I have that uh, two amp uh, yep. supply for the uh, Pi of the drive. Okay. Yeah. So uh, right over here, now I've switched over to this uh, desktop. And as you can see, this is uh, um, hopefully real time um, um, pick up, uh, transmissions from aircrafts that are, that are in the air. This is inside, so you're not going to get anywhere near the range you would expect. But at home, when I have my outside antenna, I get between 150 to 200 miles around. Because again, you know, we're talking a line of sight, but the airplanes are very high and they, they really are able to get out. So that's interesting in itself. So can you get can you get that displayed on a map? Though? Oh my goodness, this guy's prompting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll have to see. How can we do something like that? Well, I I forget. There's I played with this about a year. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. This. Yep. There, there's um. There's a program. Of, well, first off, I should probably explain what's happening here. Um, one, Google gave a, got rid of giving you free keys to Google Maps, so they annoy you by putting this uh, development purposes in here. 
These are the aircraft that you just saw. There's something just coming over Crystal between Crystal Lake and McHenry right now. This is the graphical representation of that raw data that you just saw. And um, what this is, is the page that's being served up here is actually a web server on the Raspberry Pi. So not only am I picking up the signal from the airplane and processing it, but the Raspberry Pi then is uh, feeding it into uh, the uh, program to be output onto a map. And uh, you'll see sometimes they flip up and down. It doesn't mean that the airplanes go on. It just means that not good reception yet. That's pretty cool. You can listen to that. Like I said, with an that side antenna, it's not unusual at all to get 150 miles away uh, with just a little tin can in town. <laughs> okay. Oops. How much is that receive that radio board? The radio plug-in. This one is a this one's a little more expensive because this is a uh, this is a uh, it's not a professional. It's a professional receiver for amateur radio. <laughs> but but the dongle itself you for about what 18 20 bucks or so. Yeah. It's a USB. And and really that's what this is. This the, the what I like about this this one is in a metal case that has a little more um, filtering. Um, so it's it's more suitable for You you can tell that box to just listen on a particular frequency? Yeah, anywhere from 100 kilohertz to 2 gigahertz. Wow. And the, and the dongle is pretty close to that as well. Yeah, it's got a fairly wide range. I, you know, I was able to tune, actually on my Android, I got an app where I can hook the dongle up to it and use it like a radio. I, you know, I get FM stations, the NOAA weather radio. The low frequency stuff, I had much luck with, but I think it's because of the antenna that I was using. Yeah. Well, the thing is, too, a lot of the dongles, they have a lower frequency ratio, a uh, lower um, minimal frequency, and you need to use some techniques to, to, to convert that up. Uh, I bought this because uh, I'm, I'm interested in um, displaying the, um, I'm not going to show you this, but there, there's a way of actually displaying band activity uh, all across there in a waterfall model. And so I use that in conjunction with my, 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 my amateur radio transmitter so I can see where the signals are. And then, and so I'm using this, and then my transmitter, and then I can click on my, um, I can click on the waterfall, and it will tune my radio right to where that signal is. Oh, okay. It's so easy now. Back in when I was my age, it was something else. <laughs> okay. Dinosaur room. Right. So now let's wrap this up here. <laughs> Monitor earthquakes. This is pretty interesting. I don't know if I even told you about this. I've had this for a while now. Um, this is something called the Raspberry Shake. Uh, it was uh, produced by a company in Panama. They're basically they're uh, what volcanologists or they're geologists that you know they, they they study volcanoes. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to come out with a product that could be roughly comparable in performance to like a twenty-five thousand dollar instrument, uh, for, you know, a, a commercial instrument. Obviously, they're not identical, but you know, somewhere in the performance. So a couple of years ago, they, they released the first version uh, of this, and this is called the Raspberry Shake. And uh, it's based on um, a uh, series of, um, of uh, uh, citizen reporting. Just like Weather Underground has all these, uh, these uh, uh, weather stations, uh, they're doing the same thing with, uh, with, with the seismographs here. Um, and I have a couple of one. This one's actually running at my house right now. I don't have the thing buried in a vault yet. I have it basically sitting downstairs in a quiet part of our house on a concrete slab. So the question is, is it able to really detect earthquakes? And if so, how much? And the answer to that question is, it can. Now there's a lot of, our, not everything you see here is earthquakes. This could be anything from uh, a truck going by the house, my son getting out of bed, um, but I was able to detect uh, a few earthquakes of note. Uh, one was the um, the uh, five point or six five point or six point oh in Mexico a few months back, and actually the most recent ones also showed up there. Uh, and I was able to detect the um, the North Korean nuclear test that occurred in 2017. And um, looking at this, um, it's uh, not really apparent. You, you don't know what you're seeing here, right? But we have other software that takes this, these signals, expands them, and it puts them into a waterfall. 
And then once you see it in that waterfall with the, with the different colors in there, it gets to be really easy to be able, not easy, but easier to identify things that are seismic activity versus uh, I drop something on my foot. Is there some kind of filtering going on? There's kind of like natural resonance of the earth and stuff that need to be filtered out or some kind of? They have a lot of filtering um, out on here. That's pretty that, amazing that you could yeah, that the, sensitive get stuff. That oh, it away. is extremely sensitive in here. Uh, and um, and it's almost too sensitive in terms of, of you know being able to filter all local atmosphere. But when it's quiet out there, just like when the North Caribbean uh, test was in there, I was nice and quiet in there. And when it fired off, um, it, it, it clearly registered here. Wow. It wasn't it wasn't like a earth moving experience, but it definitely registered. And um, I'll go to their site in just a bit if we're not running out of time here. I'm almost finished actually. Um, this is this this is the first unit. This one over here is actually a unit for uh, people that live in more uh, energetic areas, um, you know, California and, and places like that. And then has the side has the geophone, which is like a really sensitive microphone for very very low frequencies. But it also has four accelerometers, so it's designed to help um, differentiate uh, very strong quakes. Uh, over here, if we had a straw quake, uh, I, I don't want to see one. But if we had one, then um, this issue here would, would probably have been overloaded. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more on that in a second. Uh, there's that. Oh, this was a little ringing in here. So that was a definite hit. And then there's a little bit of ringing, which is part of having to do it. That's not natural resonance of the earth. This was this with my microphone and where I had the, had the location. Okay. What you're seeing over here is um, a product they came out with a few months ago, and it does the same thing uh, that the Raspberry Shake does, but for infrasound. So it operates on very, very low frequency sounds. And this is just actually being, be de being deployed now. Uh, and the idea here is that they're, they're doing some research to see if a, a network of these devices can provide some insight into, we don't know yet, Earth, uh, not Earth, tornadoes or uh, activity um, picks up down a little closer to uh, to the launch sites. It could pick up rock, rocket launches, a hurricane coming in uh, offshore, not up here obviously, but closer by. So uh, I have one of these now that I actually have online, and I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, seeing what I can find. But okay, now this is neat hardware. But the really, really cool thing is um, the network. So I have a unit here. There's over a thousand of the shakes deployed now, well over a thousand. The U.S. Geological Survey now has uh, actually deployed uh, these units in addition to all their other stuff to give coverage. There's a, a big uh, gathering in um, Oklahoma. I can't pick up those earthquakes. They're, they're, although they're like 3.2, 3. Point something. Uh, they're a little, I think they're probably too high. They're, they're not deep enough into the ground. If it gets deep enough where things shake, then, then I can pick it up here. So this is a, a snapshot that I took a few months back, and this was a real-time um, uh, display of earthquake activity uh, uh, around the world. And if I'm lucky, we'll see what happens. Let's see if we get an updated one. This is where the internet comes in place. There we go. And this is uh, real time. Oh, no, is that? Yeah. I had a 3.5 before there. And I got another one there. A 5.0. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Let's see if I can expand this for you a little bit. These low contrast screens. There we go. And that is real time. So this is, this is current over here. Um, and what you could do then is you can actually drill into a particular event over here, and it shows you all the, the, the different stations that have picked it up, um, and um, uh, and you get alerts whether or not they, they take your data, you, you upload the data, and uh, it's put into a, a database. And sometimes you can contribute if if they you know they're using that same analysis about the waterfall, uh, but much more sophisticated. Say hey, you just detected an earthquake. That's pretty cool. probably be useful for tsunamis and stuff because that's the yeah. That's well, they have this. Uh, the other thing is, uh, let me show you the current. This is what do you mean you can't download the information here? Try harder. 
<laughs> that always works. Uh, okay. Well, the nice thing about this, this slide deck is going to be available. You can, you can try it at home. Um, this, because you don't need you don't need to have a shake or any equipment to be able to look at this view or to see the stations. Um, because there's a. Uh, I don't like that. Okay. Maybe right. paste it into a browser. Maybe a link is good. Yeah, maybe so. But that's that, that's uh, was an exercise for the reader to uh, to do in there. Cedars are lazy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it, it will show you. Um, if only one thing went wrong here, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, the uh, or the station view uh, will give you a a list all over the world where these stations are located, and it's on a Google map. And you can actually expand it and drill down. You'll see my station here in McHenry. There's a, a couple of others in Illinois, and a ton in Oklahoma and California, and places that are probably a little more interesting for earthquakes than here. Uh, but I'm prepared for New Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> right. Again, I have uh, the slide deck, the, the full slide deck, which is uh, this and more. Yeah, that one works. Who knows? I don't know. I just, this is the slide deck is here, and you can go down there at any time and download it. It also gives you some other fun things with uh, about the pie and the presentation. So, thank you for bringing up with this, and I'm really kind of happy that most of this worked pretty well. <laughs> Uh, any other questions we have in here? Uh, otherwise, we'll turn it over to um, to Thank you.